Universal moral intuitions exist. Universal moral intuitions exist. Let's try and develop a better syllogism, shall we, when it comes to objective morals. There's the famous uh, William Lane Craig one. Objective morals exist, therefore God exists. That's the gist of the argument. Um, you can see the flaws in that right away. So let us try to develop a better one. Universal moral intuitions exist. That would be premise one. Now, that is debatable, sure. That's not a slam dunk case closed fact, but most of the empirical, sociological, and psychological evidence seems to indicate that that would be true. That would be a capital T truth, that universal morals exist. Jordan Peterson believes it. Sam Harris believes it. Most of your highbrow, well-educated atheists are coming around to that conclusion. Jonathan Haidt believes it. I believe that this is the cutting edge of where science and sociology are meeting and they are deciding that such a thing as universal moral intuitions exist. Now, taking that as our starting point, we can examine a holy text, be it a Koran or a Bible or a Buddhist, uh, what's the holy text of a Buddhist, uh, Buddhist what? <laughs> Buddhist parchment? I don't, what, what, what's the holy text of Buddhism? A Buddhist book? I, I don't know, a Buddhist something or other. What is the holy, is there a holy book of Buddhism? Uh, I don't know, I can't think of what it's called. What's the holy book? I, I don't know, never mind. Uh, a Koran, a Bible, or a Bhagavad Gita. Now, you have your cuckoo clock religions, right? Yeah, we could come with, let's just be honest about it. You got your cuckoo clock religions. You got your religions that are kind and normal, and you got your religions that are totally out there. Well, we can analyze the holy text of any given religion empirically, analytically, and decide as psychologists and sociologists and thinking rational human beings. We're rationalists, say this. Remember, we're all rational, reasonable human beings here. And we can decide whether the values and the ethics the normative ethics described in that text line themselves up properly with universal moral intuitions. So we can analyze its content and decide whether the truths that it expressed in its holy book are in fact capital T truths. You'll find some in the Koran probably. I've never read the Koran. You find some in, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the, in the Hindu texts. There is real truths in there. People aren't complete idiots. They're not keep revering these books because they have nothing of value in them. That's some sort of, you know, inane perception about religion actually is. The reason why they are holding these texts as sacred to begin with is that there are, in fact, capital T truths embedded therein. And they can be analyzed from a rationalist point of view. Do they line up with universal moral ethics? This is, this, is a, this is easy to do. Now, you take a cuckoo clock religion. Uh, what's, a, what's a good version, example of a cuckoo clock religion? Um, 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 uh, Scientology. Yeah, Dianetics. Did you ever read Dianetics? I, I always intended to and never got around to it. I don't know the actual cosmology behind Dianetics or Scientology, but it's really out there. It's really, really, really out there. It's some sort of, it really is. It's really, really insane. There's a South Park episode dedicated to it once, and they had a little caption underneath saying, this is the actual cosmology of Scientology. And it's like, there's, there's some, something from the planet Zorg. Uh, I, I don't even remember, but it has something to do with space aliens giving birth to Earth. And I, I don't, and they don't tell you the Dianetics until you get to a certain level within the cult, uh, religion, uh, religion, I meant religion. So that's a cuckoo clock religion. And you can analyze its, its content empirically. How rational and reasonable is the idea that, you know, all life was created from space aliens, let's say. Not very. How plausible is that? Not very. Now, how plausible is Jesus rose from the dead? Not very. But you can analyze the ethical content of the Bible from a different point of view, rationally, reasonably. Let's take, for example, just one scripture I'll think of off the top of my head, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 5, I think that's it. That's the memorable, you know, 
God being God in the form of man humbled himself on a cross, something like that. Uh, I should probably look it up, but I won't bother. Um, no, here's my Bible. I'll try to look it up while I'm, while I'm chatting. Philippians 2.5, it's all about humility. Now, leaving aside whether you think Jesus rode for the dead, or is in fact even a real human, really existed, irrelevant. You can analyze the ethical content of the scriptures empirically. Empirically. From a sociological, psychological, and I guess philosophical and moral perspective. So, I can't find, I can't find it. Philippians 2.5. Uh, Corinthians, Ephesus, Ephesus, okay, here we go, Philippians 2.5, found it. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashionable men, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. What's the message? You a big deal guy. Cool. Prove it by humbling yourself. Humbling yourself. Taking the form of a servant. That's a message that's reiterated time and time again in the Bible. The greatest among you shall be the servant of all. Now that can be analyzed empirically, sociological, from a sociological point of view. If your CEO approached his career as a CEO, as a servant of everybody in the company, wouldn't he be a better city CEO? Yes. Rationally, reasonably speaking, logically speaking, of course he would. So we can analyze that premise of the Bible, that ethic that the Bible tries to implant in the reader time and time again. There's tons of messages about humility in the Bible and the importance of humility in the Bible. Now, if we're excellent rationalists, and some of us are excellent rationalists, and we're excellent scientists and sociologists, we could actually study the value of humility in day-to-day -day life. I bet you anything somebody could do. I bet you there's probably 15 of them out there where people find out that it's probably better for your mental health to be humble as opposed to arrogant. Bet you anything. It's axiomatic, sure. It's better to be humble than arrogant, but it's probably also scientifically proved verifiable. I bet you anything there are studies that people have more successful lives tend to be humble in the value of humility in day-to-day -day life. The Bible has 6,000 different messages on the value of humility. That was just one off the top of my head. So we can study the ethical content of the Bible from an empirical sociological point of view, analytically speaking, and decide, does this line up with what are universal moral ethics and values, universal moral intuitions? Do the same thing for every holy book under the sun and actually, you know, decide, are there capital T truths in this book? I mean, you could do this for fiction too. This is just for the purposes of this conversation. I'm just pointing out something. So that is one way of qualifying religious texts, religious truths, to decide if they are capital T truths, actual true truths. It's not the stories themselves. This is what Peterson is getting at. That's why I say Peterson is game-changing. It's not the stories themselves. It's the ethical content. It's what they're trying to teach people. It's the, it's the stories and the commentary and what they are trying to plant in the reader to bring about a change. We call that change a spiritual change, but you could also call it an ethical change. You can call it a transformation of the human being. That's what religion is actually doing. It's trying to plant something inside of you. And it need not be a blind process. We can use the same rationalist tools that we apply to anything else and start applying it to religion. It need not dismantle religion. This is why I said Peterson is game-changing. Did anything I say strike you as something that could be... That is, almost everything I said struck you as something pretty easily scientifically verifiable, correct? Yes. Why? Because it's essentially true. True truths. That's the key to science, people. Science discovers truth. It's not a creative process, it's an investigative process. A same investigative process that can be implied to the Bible, and the Bible need not fall apart under the scrutiny.
This is what I'm trying to say. This is why it's revolution. It's why it's game-changing. Amen. That's all for now.